This is a fax from the artist David Shrigley. He doesn't like TV much, which is a shame because this is a film about David Shrigley. Shrigley is one of the biggest stars of the British contemporary art world, but unlike many other successful young artists, he keeps a very low media profile. He works in photography and sculpture, but is best known for his books of drawings. I like the idea of you being on the tube or the train and you're reading a David Shrigley book, and you get the idea that the person next to you is thinking, oh, oh, it's cartoons, you know, and they're kind of leaning in. And then you get the feeling, maybe they're a little disturbed. They think, oh, this is not exactly what I thought it was. His books of drawings have attracted a cult following. He has published 19 so far, the latest of which sold out on publication. This is unheard of for an art book. People I know use Shrigley's work as a personality test. I know a number of people who won't enter relationships with other people unless the other people find Shrigley's work funny. Hard to explain, but spirit world becomes visible, boots filled with hot coffee, no trousers. Fucks, licks, magic stump. Neat line drawn by Granny indicating limits of acceptable behavior in Granny's house. <laughs> But while his style is instantly recognisable, Shrigley isn't. Very few people even know what he looks like. He almost takes on a role comparable to Woody Allen's character Zelig, this ordinary guy who seems to turn up at all the crucial moments of world and cultural history. He has this kind of almost totemistic presence as the Joker in the pack. The band Blur commissioned Shrigley to make the video for their latest single, Good Song. Shrigley is moving from cult hero to mainstream art star, but remains keen to preserve his anonymity. David Shrigley didn't want to be in this film, so this is a photograph of him. But we can't be sure. Certainly not anti-Christianity and very pro, really, religious beliefs in general. This is a recording of his voice, but we can't be sure of that either. I'm sure that... I'm sure that... Hello? But Michael Bracewell was there and he says it's him. All I can say is it's definitely David Shrigley. To find out more about David Shrigley and his work, we went to Glasgow, where he came to art school in 1989 and never left the city. Shrigley Tour, those of you joining a Shrigley Tour. Anybody else with Shrigley Tour? Leaving in a few minutes. We did what all tourists seem to do when they come to Glasgow, take a guided bus tour. Except we had to invent one first. We seek him here, we seek him there. This mysterious Shrigley could be anywhere. David Shrigley was accepted on the unappealingly titled Environmental Art degree course in 1989. He was part of a whole generation of kind of anarchic pranksters who I don't think we actually could teach them anything. I think they knew what they wanted to do and they got on with it. In the early 1990s, Glasgow was transforming itself from an industrial city to a European city of culture. Shiny, imposing new buildings like Norman Foster's conference centre, nicknamed the Armadillo, sprang up on the old Docklands. David Shrigley satirised this regeneration with a photo called Ignore This Building. It's basically just a, a wee sign which says Ignore This Building, which he placed directly across from the armadillo. It's a massive overstatement of a building. And Dave said, yeah, it's not very good. Just walk away. He made a few public works that seemed to be quite barbed comments on gentrification. A key one would be the ship. OK, this is not a toilet break. This building 
was another milestone in the artist's career. This run-down toilet. Shrigley's joke really was to put a sign above it which just said the ship to make it look as though it was an old pub. And the best thing was that I think there were letters to the press from local pubs complaining that this new pub had opened and didn't have planning permission. A Shrigley tour would visit places that feature in Shrigley's work. But the works themselves wouldn't be there, you know, the works would have long gone. One of his projects was a cardboard box on a bit of wasteland with two windows and a door cut out and it said, Leisure Centre. But the waste ground is really specifically Glaswegian. It's the waste ground that you'd find next to a demolished tenement. Leisure Centre is almost like sort of rubbing salt into the open wound of people's distress or the fact that they've been you know, neglected um, by uh, society or fate is like saying, well, you know, there you go, there's your leisure centre and it's an old cardboard box. Over to your left is a very spot where Shrigley hung his motorway sign marking the entrance to hell. Shrigley takes the way in which a day in the urban context is a day of absorbing signs as if they were captions. What it does is to it's mirror the subliminal way in which we pick up on signs. They, they flip by in our peripheral vision and we half register them. On your left you can see Calvin Grove Park. It was this tree over there, but it taped is now legendary Lost Pigeon Work. Or was it Thatchy? Lost Pigeon uses all the language that would normally draw you into a sign like that that's, oh, it's a lost puppy, and, you know, some little boy has lost its something or other. Instead, it's a pigeon, it's a man key, it's ugly, it's a rat with wings. It's like he's got you, it's like, you know, he's done it again. Anything he comes across, any object on the street or something, Shrigley would be able to write something on it that would turn it on its head. David did a photograph of a, a file of fax, something which became a symbol of the kind of 80s and power and business. He doesn't want it returned. I thought that was very positive because you wanted to change your life. This was my life up to now. I want to go and change it. Everything there, everyone I know, I'm going to leave behind and do, do something else. And I think that there's a sense of freedom. You don't know if David is actually going around the world one hour before you and leaving these signs stuck onto something for you to find. Or there is a conspiracy of more Davids who are actually doing this around the world, going and leaving these kind of traces. I guess you're all really desperate to know what Dave Shrigley actually looks like. I picture him sort of dark hair. Lots of unruly hair. A shock of uh, blonde, fair hair. There's a self-portrait in this book. Strange gap between his ears, his nose, uh, free-floating in air. How tall he is. I just imagine him short. Very tall. Certainly. Well over six feet. Six foot five in sandals. No, 6'5", that can't be. I'm probably about 6'6 six, six in heels. Just like seven foot giant with a huge head. <laughs> OK, now, driver, can we move out, please? Now, the artist was born in Macclesfield in 1968. The infant Shrigley was born with hair and teeth. He grew a beard and started using foul language at the age of one. David Shrigley graduated from Glasgow Art School in 1991 and contemplated how to start his life as an artist. Shrigley, armed with his magnificent to-do degree, ventured into the world 
but he found his dream of becoming a public artist like Venice was sinking fast. When you look back at the time that David Trigley graduated, the phenomenon that would be known as young British art is beginning to gather momentum, which was all to do with professionalism and big galleries and media coverage and all that sort of stuff. I didn't think I could walk the walk and talk the talk, and I didn't think that the kind of art that I made would be taken seriously by the what I perceived to be the art establishment. So I guess I decided to become a cartoonist when I left because I thought it was a job that I could maybe do. David comes along and his work seems almost utterly lo-fi, pure sort of independent production. All the stuff that made the phenomenon known as YBA tick, David just completely uh, undermines. Artists talk about their work. One artist. I don't actually do the paintings myself. I get a bunch of handicapped kids to do them for me. Another artist. I use a lot of found materials in my work. My latest piece is 50 identical pairs of children's shoes, which I found in a charity shop. They're brilliant and they only cost £30. Another artist. I go around bars at the weekends and deliberately get into fights and get my head kicked in while a friend of mine videos it. Instead of sort of going off with all these kind of grand ideas and stuff like that, I just got a photocopier and some pens. He made sketchy comic drawings, sometimes just doodles while he was on the phone, and worked them up into finished cartoons. These are from his first self-published book called Slug Trails. I sold those books to my friends and then um, went to art openings and followed people to the pub and once I'd sold a few books, I could buy a few drinks. So I was able to sell a few more to some strangers who were probably themselves a little bit drunk and didn't really mind spending, spending a little bit of money on some rubbish photocopied book. Swing. First we hung him, then we hung his wife, then we hung his buddy, then we hung his kids, then we hung his dog, then we cut him down and gave him a decent hot meal. <laughs> he often, in the earlier work, will create narratives in sequential boxes in the sort of traditional comic form. Um, and then that changes. And it was here in this very tavern that the moment happened which happens to all great artists. Strictly, don't bother making your drawings neat. Your crap ones are better. I think his friends told him that they preferred the scratchy drawings and that he should try to just show those rather than the finished ones. How would you describe his drawings? That's such a hard question. Very old little drawings. Scratchy. Visceral. Abject. Scrawled. Nonsense. Instead of aiming for a line that is in some sense pure or defined or simple or elegant, he seems to aim deliberately for a line that is obscured, confused, rubbed out, deteriorated, childish in some sense. So I don't actually think the graphics are childish. They're not actually uh, as a child draws. They're rather the drawings of a childlike adult the skill with which he does that, so it's impossible in a sense to, to see whether it's intentional or whether they've simply arrived at that, that he's some kind of uh, graphic idiot savant in that way, is amazing and very arresting. The best, and there was a little crossing out, I ever had. It's just this list of short sentences of, you know, the best little crossing out I ever had was with little crossing out. It was really great. We did it, little crossing out, forever, and so on and so forth. Immediately, you get this idea that, you know, is this some sort of horrible fantasy, you know, by some loner? Mum and Dad are downstairs watching Last of the Summer Wine. David is upstairs in his room drawing pictures of torture and Satan. <laughs> My parents are Christians, fundamental Christian. Well, my dad is fundamental Christian. My mum's just an Anglican, um, regular. Yeah, I suppose it had to be quite an influence on my 
life are quite interested in religious thought and the meaning of life. What constitutes a virtuous life and what happens after you die? The first major article about David Shrigley's work appeared in the Bible of the contemporary art scene, Freeze magazine. Michael Bracewell described Shrigley in the piece as a religious artist. He saw individuals and humankind as being in the devil's palm, that it was not a safe, benign universe. It was not a place where, you know, the best of all possible worlds. It was somewhere that was cruel and judgmental. In fact, I think the reason why I called David Trigley a religious artist was because it was like reading contemporary illustrations to the Old Testament. Here we are with the results. There was good versus evil. Good were wearing the white shirts and white shorts, and evil were wearing the black shirts and the black shorts. At the end of 90 minutes, it was nil-nil, but after extra time, evil won five foreign penalties. The god of Shrigley is, is, a, is an Old Testament god who, uh, who works in a leisure centre. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a sort of, uh, you know, an omnipotent character that is grossly circumscribed by a bad bus timetable. His books continued to attract a cult following through the 1990s, but after the Freeze article, Shrigley was suddenly perceived as a fine artist rather than a cartoonist. In 1995, his first solo show took place here at the Transmission Gallery. The sculpture works were one set of works where, you know, a whole new medium appeared. OK, folks, just come in and take a seat here, but you can. Or just stand around the back. Plenty of space. I remember his show in Transmission quite clearly, you know, with uh, these quite beautifully made sculptures of, you know, the gunk that you find in between the cooker and you know, the fridge, things like that. The piece I remember most distinctly was a hurdle that he had made. It started off in the basement of the gallery. The legs of it came up through the basement space and came up through the floor. I think that probably is a reflection of the artist's extreme height. You know, I'm very preoccupied by scale, and I think that's a function of extreme height. I think people who are, you know, do who are either very tall or very small often find themselves preoccupied by the body and its relationship with space. David's objects come from a different process than his drawings and his photographs. They are very much more considered. The first thing that struck me was they were really well made and really well crafted, which is not um, what I think of um, with his drawings. I actually really like making things, but I realized that, that at the time when I'm actually filling and painting and stuff, I'm not doing anything that I'm good at. But I decided that I didn't want to make any art objects that took longer than a day to make. There's a, this great series of works involving making sculptures or just um, doing things in parks that simply involve them cutting out little eyes and sticking them on. They suddenly look like they're little people. That idea of animating the world or making it seem strange is a key thing that art does. It's about Defamiliarisation is about trying to change the way that you, you look at things. But not all his fans warm to the 3D work. Without wishing to be overly critical, I think the problem is that once it moves into three dimensions, on the whole it becomes as easily dismissed as a lot of contemporary conceptual art, precisely because what makes it, his work brilliant is the fact that it's on the page and the fact that it's an evolution of a, of a cartoon medium. David Shrigley is currently exhibiting to his biggest audience yet with a show of work in the London Underground. He is a true public artist because his work exists beyond the world of art galleries. Paul Womble thinks the more his work appears to land by accident in our world, the more powerful it is. 
they just come across one. And what is it doing there? That's what it should be. It shouldn't be the grand statement as art. It should be something which kind of lives in the world. You come across it, and it's probably only two days later that you realise that you've been taken in, or it'll come back in your, in your mind in some way, in your memory. The great man's lair. It's the culmination of today's tour, so here we go. Uh, can I help? Uh, maybe. We're, you know, this is the Shrigley tour. We're supposed to be David Shrigley here. Uh -huh. Who are you? I'm his assistant, Andy. Right, so do you not know about this? No. Wonderful. I don't think that David Shrigley could appear in a documentary about himself. At a time when the cult of personality dominated British art, you know, that you had to be a superstar, you know, David plays around with the whole idea of what the identity of an artist is. I come in every morning and he leaves me a list on his table and this is the list he, he kind of wrote me. You don't so, actually see him? No. He can be all these other people in his art. He can be a devil, he can be a god, he can be a dog, he can be a bus shelter, he can be whatever he wants. Um, is that based on anybody real? Um, yeah, I think it's based on the artist himself. Mm. Yeah, looks quite a lot like him. Yeah. Um. Maybe David doesn't want to let Everybody in. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye. Maybe he wants to keep something for himself. He could be sitting next to me on a bus, kind of quietly drawing something, and I wouldn't have any idea. Oh my God, that's David Shrigley. I quite like that he's kind of anonymous out there in the world, making his comments on things. Because one of the things that's vital to looking at a David Shrigley is what kind of person could possibly, you know, be making a career in the world of contemporary art out of this. The novelist David Peace is the star of the art show next Friday at 7.30. Next tonight, young Israelis and how they cope living with the constant fear of terror. It's Unreported World.